So I'll start. Um, OK, so we'll start off by saying that Bitcoin is working, which is really cool. Uh, transactions are propagated. Blocks start with a lot of zeros. Coins seem to stay put when you don't move them and move when you tell them to. And this is really cool, and I didn't think that would happen. Um, but it does, so this is great. So we're starting from a good place. Um, but we should acknowledge that Bitcoin can fail. Uh, but but anti-fragile, right? So are, you know, am I talking about the final block of Bitcoin? You know, what, what is the block height of the final block? There are maybe fates worse than a final block. Um, so I have a Bitcoin failure bathtub. And I put some you know, global data rate on the bottom, which is totally made up. But um, it fails on both sides. Um, it, it can fail if you go too far in any direction. And so there's this sort of Goldilocks zone or middle of the bathtub. Maybe I shouldn't mix metaphors. Or, but uh, there's, a, there's a good place in the middle. Um, and so the block size bathtub, uh, we can take the extreme numbers so that we all agree that, like, yeah, this is crazy. So what would Bitcoin be like with one kilobyte blocks? Uh, so maybe one byte per second. You could sort of talk the blockchain to people over the phone. Um, how about with one petabyte blocks? So it would be about a terabyte of data a second. Um, and I think everyone can agree that both sides are pretty bad. And we can sort of call both failure. Um, however, in this model, we sort of uh, underlying assumption in both of these failure modes is that every human on planet Earth wants to use Bitcoin and would if they could. And so actually, this is not a particularly pessimistic view of failure, um, because most people don't know about Bitcoin or care. Uh, so we're assuming everyone wants to use this. OK, so first I'll talk about the red side. Um, uh, this is a key failure. And one transaction per block means there's maybe 100 transactions a day. The block size increases by you know, 50 megs a year which is good in that you can run a full node on your phone. Uh, 50 megs is no, no big deal. Um, however, there's maybe 10 large institutions in the world that actually have private keys and can make transactions. So you got Coinbase, ChangeDip, Bank of America, BNY Mellon. They have keys. You don't. Uh, but you have sort of bank accounts with them. Uh, this is a very possible thing, and it's a, it's a failure. Um, this is a failure because you don't have the keys, you don't have the coins. This was sort of the central promise of Bitcoin. You can't be your own bank. You can, however, verify all balances that your bank holds for you. So it's kind of like good delivery bars in the basement of a bank. And you can maybe see them, but you can't touch them. And it's a little bit better than good delivery bars because it's, it's more like this picture than that picture. Because you can sort of see it, you can verify it, but it's, it's still a failure mode. Um, so look at the blue side. Um, this is a 21 million failure. Uh, so in this case, you have you know, 50 exabytes a year block size increase. Um, all seven giga humans can use Bitcoin as many times a day as they want. Uh, they've got a gazillion private keys on their phone. SPV still works. Uh, the proofs are quite compact. Maybe it's you know, 20 steps instead of 10. Um, and phones can store the header set for, for SPV validations, 4 megs a year. Um, however, in this case, there's maybe 10 large institutions that can store and verify the blockchain. So you got Amazon, Visa, Google, Bank of America, UnionPay. Slightly different set of factors, maybe, but same idea. Uh, you can verify when you receive coins, but you can't verify everyone else's. So there's really no way to be sure there's 21 million coins. There may have been more that sort of got in there without you knowing. And unless you've got a global view of it, you don't know the total capitalization. Um, so in that case, the failure mode is sort of like Federal Reserve notes. You don't really know how many dollars there are. You can val validate individual dollars and to see that they're not counterfeit. But the total amount of dollars, I don't know. You can ask Fred. But um, So what we want to do is expand the bathtub. Um, we we want to make sure that we're within the bathtub. And that's sort of why we have this conference. But also expanding it would help. And in this, it's you know, totally not to scale. I don't think you know, a 512 gigabyte per second rate actually would be within the bathtub. It's probably way too high. Um, so how can we expand usability without hurting verifiability? So methods that you know, move things user to user and have user verification without global verification. And so one way to help with this is linked nodes of payment channels. And it sort of expands the bathtub to the red side, where more people can use it without the higher global throughput. And Joseph will talk about how we can do that. Yeah, so an example of expanding this, expanding this bathtub is what we've been working on called the Lightning Network. 
and the idea is that you know even if you're not you know totally picking the right point maybe it's a little bit low um, or you know and you need to mitigate the problems where you know when things get high the validation starts getting really complicated um, you can still be able to use Bitcoin you can have your own private keys and use the use real Bitcoin um, and the problems it really helps with is to net settle many transactions, especially micropayments. Um, so, for example, you can have one blockchain transactions, and it can be um, the net sum of you know many hundreds or thousands or millions of transactions. Um, and there are things which it helps which you can't do on Bitcoin today. Um, a lot of people think you can do micropayments on Bitcoin. It's not really true. Um, micropayments which are below a minimum fee, um, like uh, one penny or even a tenth of a penny or a hundredth of a penny. Um, Bitcoin blockchain transactions are about you know three cents today, somewhere in that range. Um, you might be able to get down to two cents or a little bit below that, but you definitely will have trouble sending you know a hundredth of a cent. And something like uh, a network of payment channels certainly helps with that. Um, and if fees ever start going up or down or something based on you know variability in the times, um, a fee market where large value transaction crowds out low value transactions, where you know the confirmation times start getting very high, um, will be very complicated. And Lightning is and other payment channel networks are very are do instant transactions. Um, it also helps with the UTXO set float, um, and there's not much talk about this, but the problem is basically where. If you are receiving, you know, a million micropayments um, on chain, um, it's sort of like no matter like how big the block size is within reason, um, you're going to have trouble because you're going to be having a million transactions as your inputs with a single output, right? That's a really, really big transaction. Um, these cases can happen in the future. For example, if you're getting paid, like a newspaper is getting paid for a very popular article or something like that, and you're might be signing, you know, a hundred, like a million times or whatever it is, um, for only a couple cents. Um, you might have seen these types of transactions if you like browse around blockchain.info and you're like, whoa, <laughs> what's going on with this transaction? Um, yeah, those transactions are pretty crazy, and you want to really minimize those because they're a large component of uh, blockchain bloat. And the idea of something like a Lightning Network is where um, you have a channel open. So for example, Alice has a channel open with Bob, Bob has a channel open with Carol, and Carol has a channel open with Dave. Alice can pay Dave without direct counterparty risk for each hop. So there's no component where like Bob and Carol can like steal the funds in transit, um, where you know directly and easily they're just like, okay, here's the money, I'm just gonna take it. Um, and you can do that by encumbering it in cryptographic hashes. Um, using directly on, big, on like Bitcoin scripts, which if um, there is non-cooperation, it does hit the chain. Um, but otherwise, it's all off-chain. Um, while these are actual Bitcoin transactions with consensus enforced on the blockchain, um, payment, pa payment paths are local. Um, so we do need to focus on designing this correctly and ensuring that it is decentralized and within the spirit of Bitcoin's values. Um, and the primary aspect is to ensure there's no custodial ownership along the path, especially payment. Um, and that means that you need open participation, anyone can run a node, and you need extremely low fees as a result. So trusting a third party custodian with your balance um, will be giving them a lot of economic rent. Um, so that means that if you're trusting someone for your money, um, you're sort of trusting them not to screw you over. So you know they might charge a higher amount for that. Um, routing is also very, very important um, because routing is sort of like everything. It's your client that sort of decides how to route, so that's sort of a local rule in a sense. And therefore, it's really important to ensure and enforce routing maintains decentralization. And it's really also important to make sure wallets are also channel nodes uh, to ensure this form of decentralization. And the ideal is you sort of create this system in which you, know, you can do small Bitcoin transactions uh, in very, very high volume on Bitcoin and maintains like the promise of Bitcoin. And that way you can sort of like be within the bathtub. Oh. Okay, do we have time? We, oh, well, we can also, no. yeah. um, the other thing, we can sort of look at 
within the failure modes, like where in the bathtub you want to be. Right. Um, my personal feeling is that the red side is probably safer yeah. in that you know you want the extra functionality, but one of the assumptions here was that all seven billion people want to use Bitcoin. That may not be the case, and that may never be the case. Um, and it's 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 a kind of a crazy assumption also because maybe no one wants to use it because it's too expensive to make transactions, and they're saying like, why should I sign up for this new system where uh, you know some third party entity has all the private keys? That's not really advantageous. Um, however, there's a, in both cases there's a lot of things you can do to mitigate these failures. So in the case of you know too large uh, transactions, you know there's SPV, fraud proofs, um, a lot of things like that. And then on the lower uh, bandwidth side, you can have you know proof of solvency, you know different proofs where you are minimizing the trust to these institutions. They're actually quite different though. So then in both sort of modes where we're not in a place where we want to be, we have these institutions that are now sort of centralized, and we can have ways to mitigate that centralization. Yeah, and our um, thinking for doing this presentation is that like, we can all agree that we really don't want to be on either side and we sort of define this like common ground. Yeah, so, right. so you know, where exactly that is, that's a very difficult problem because everyone's going to have a different opinion, but at least as long as everyone's like, yeah, let's be here, let's be here, let's be here, then we can sort of put boundaries and try to figure out how to you know, work within there. And so then, which side is ideal? I think, like, my opinion is, you know, towards the left, but you know, within reason. Yeah. Um, but but you want the functionality because then that seven billion people wanting to use it will never happen yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have the functionality there. Um, okay. So I think we're probably early. But <laughs> any questions? Are we good? Or? We're good. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, and thank you, Taj.